welcome to our third history talk of this season. Um, some of you who are here uh, and join us regularly, you'll notice a new addition to our history talks, which is our tea and water refreshments. Please feel free to help yourselves. It is a bit chillier outside, so I've added tea and hot cider to our menu. <laughs> Yes, so feel free to help yourselves. Um, so welcome, and then welcome to those who are watching over Zoom. Um, for those of you here tonight, if you haven't already, um, we'd love for you to sign in at the end of our presentation so we can get an accurate head count of how many people were here today. Um, you can also use that form to sign up for our newsletter. My name is Felicia, and I'm the museum coordinator for the Lacey Museum. For tonight's program, we are joined by Julia Pinnix, Visitor Service Manager for Nisqually National Wildlife Refuge Complex. In today's presentation, Julia will explore some of the storylines that converge in today's National Wildlife Refuge. Before we dive in, I would like to begin with a land acknowledgement and some museum news. The Lacey Museum um, is on the ancestral land of the tribal people of the Treaty of Medicine Creek, including the Nisqually Indian Tribe and Squaxin Island Tribe. We acknowledge and remember those tribal people not recognized today who were absorbed or relocated into other tribes for survival. We recognize the ancestors and their descendants who are still here. We recognize and respect the tribal people of the Treaty of Medicine Creek as the traditional stewards of this land since time immemorial and their role today in taking care of these lands in uh, perpetuity. We recognize and have the responsibility to call attention to the histories of dispossession, forced removal, and abridged treaty rights that allowed our nation, state, and city to develop as they have today. We recommend that community members read the Medicine Creek Treaty of 1854. Okay. Alrighty, we would love to see you at the museum as always. We are open Thursdays and Fridays, 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. and Saturdays, 10 a.m. to 4. Um, and just a heads up, this weekend in observance of the Veterans Day holiday, we will be closed on Saturday. Uh, come view our Smithsonian poster exhibit called Journey Stories. This exhibit explores how movement has shaped our nation with a look at American expansion and migration from the earliest settlers and Native American displacement to the effects of transportation on modern mobility. We are also selling Thurston County Historical Journals at the conclusion of tonight's program. If you are interested in purchasing those, they will be available on the back table. Um, we do take card or cash payments, and they are also available at the museum for purchase. Coming up next month, we hope you'll join us for our December History Talk uh, with historian and author Drew Crooks. Drew will share history about Hudson Bay Company official William Fraser Tolmy. Tolmy was a man who left behind a strong legacy that even now is remembered in the region. Okay, so now for tonight's presentation, as always, our Q&A section will be at the end. Um, we will do our best to get questions from our in-person and online attendees. Uh, for those in-person who have questions, I will be walking around with a microphone. So if you do have a question, raise your hand. I will come running with that microphone for you. Um, for folks who are watching over Zoom, uh, there is a Q&A button on your screen, which is typically located at the bottom, um, and we will be monitoring those to get those questions asked as well. Uh, now I would like to do, introduce tonight's speaker, Julia Pinnix. Julia is the Visitor Services Manager for Nisqually National Wildlife Refuge Complex. She has worked for the U.S. Forest Service National Park Service and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and for private companies and nonprofits in the Pacific Northwest and Alaska. A graduate of the College of Environment, formerly Huxley Environmental Education, she serves to connect public lands and people. Thank you, Julia, for being with us tonight. See how this mic's doing. Oh, that's pretty good. How's it sound? Lovely. Um, the last couple of presentations I've been doing without a microphone, so I'm really grateful not to have to yell for the next hour. Well, thank you for, uh, for asking me to be here. I really get to work in a special place. And one of the first things I did when I got to that place a little more than a year ago now was to dive into its history and purpose because I like to have an idea of why a place is important and why I'm doing my job there. So 
let's uh, let's dive into that together. Let's look at a little history of this place. We're going to start off with a question. So what is a National Wildlife Refuge? A couple of clues up here. Yeah, it's, it's not a zoo, right? If you come to the Wildlife Refuge, you don't know what you're going to see. You're likely to see something, but you don't know what it's going to be. And it's not a park either, even though it acts an awful lot like a park. You can come out there and you can walk on trails and you can uh, do some of the same kinds of things that you do in a park, but it's a little bit different. So what is a Wildlife Refuge for? That's one of its purposes. That's definitely going on right now. Yeah, lots of geese. Oh my goodness, so many geese. I have to tell you some bad news about the geese though pretty shortly. This is what it's for, right? It's for wildlife. So here's my safety message for the evening. Avian influenza. We're having a really, 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 really bad year for avian influenza. Um, there is a population of terns, for example, in northern Puget Sound that um, lost half its population. And in the entire flyway for that tern species, they've lost right now up to, I think, 10 to 12 percent of the entire population in the flyway. That's outrageous. And right now it's hitting cackling geese especially hard. So if you're coming to the refuge and you're seeing lots and lots and lots of cackling geese, they're very vulnerable. If you see a dead bird, don't touch it because this disease hops into mammals. It's already killed some harbor seals. It's been found in a raccoon. You don't want it because your survival rate is around 40, 42 percent. It means you're likely to die if you get the avian influenza. So don't get it. Don't touch dead birds. Please report them. Please report them to the state. Report them to us. Report them to whoever you need to. But don't go handling birds. Okay, there's my safety message for this evening. And it's a serious one. But let's go back to refuges. There are 570 National Wildlife Refuges. You'll notice the number on the screen is 590. That's my best guess based on the things that are de facto refuges, but that we don't call refuges. For example, I work for the Nisqually National Wildlife Refuge Complex. That means the Grays Harbor National Wildlife Refuge, the Billy Frank Jr. Nisqually National Wildlife Refuge, and a thing called the Black River Unit. Why do we call it a unit? Because we made it at a time when the administration didn't support things that had the title National Wildlife Refuge, so we called it a unit. I don't know, but there's some other things like that out there. So more or less 590 sites, but 570 places that actually have the title National Wildlife Refuge nationwide. In fact, we manage more surface area on the planet than a lot of countries do. It's a lot of land and a lot of water that we take care of under this system. So what is the mission of the National Wildlife Refuge system? Here it is, to administer a national network of lands and waters for the conservation, management, and where appropriate, restoration, we'll get into that, of the fish, wildlife, and plant resources and their habitats within the United States for the benefit of present and future generations. It's kind of a big mission, and it's quite a mouthful. That was written by Congress. Uh, when they established the National Wildlife Refuge System. I want to take us farther back. I want to answer the question, why is it the Fish and Wildlife Service aren't fish wildlife? You're going to find out the answer to that and more as we go through this. I want to start with the Fish and Wildlife Service itself and where it started and how it came to be and how the refuges are a part of that. We're going to have to go back to this president. Who is this president? Yeah, show this to younger people and they're, they're not so quick with the answer. But we all know that this is President Ulysses S. Grant, right? And he took a big step towards helping to conserve wildlife when he created the U.S. Commission to Fish and Fisheries. As you can see, that was back in 1871. And he did it because fish stocks were collapsing. This is not a modern problem in the sense that it's not happening in the last 100 years. It's been happening even before that. Um, it is a modern problem in the sense that 500 years ago, you probably didn't have to worry too much about fish populations collapsing, but you sure did by the end of the 1800s. So he established the U.S. Commission of Fish and Fisheries to come up with some ideas about what we were going to do around that problem. 
One of the first things they did was start the National Fish Hatchery System. They started in uh, with Baird Station. That was the first one built the very next year, and it was in part built by the fellow on this screen here. His name was Livingston Stone. So National Fish Hatcheries were considered to be a solution. If fish are disappearing, let's put some more fish back in the river. I worked for Leavenworth Fisheries Complex over on the east side of Washington State, and I represented three different National Fish Hatcheries in a conservation office. During the time that I was working there, uh, we got a report card from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, which looked at all of the work that had been done in the Columbia River Basin, which is where we were located, to see if it was making a difference. And the report card came back as an F. We weren't making any difference. After 20 years, we had done nothing to increase the numbers of the fish. That's really discouraging. What that really told us is that this long-standing experiment with hatcheries was not the solution, that we need bigger solutions and better ones. But it was where we started, was with our national fish hatcheries. Now, Livingston Stone was a pretty big thinker. He wasn't satisfied with fish hatcheries either. He thought it was a whole lot better idea to protect a fish stock before it collapses. Sounds pretty reasonable, doesn't it? And he found a spot he liked. It was in Alaska. He got the ear of this president, big prized. Anybody who can tell me who this is? Not Cleveland. I've only ever met one person who got it. I was just floored. This is Benjamin Harrison. He may not have done anything particularly memorable besides this, but this was a big one. So he set aside a Fognac Island. How many of you know uh, Kodiak Island in Alaska? Yeah, so a Fognac Island is part of the Kodiak Archipelago. And a Fognac Island became our first de facto national wildlife refuge. Uh, it was the Fognac Forest and Fish Culture Reserve. And they were protecting marine mammals like the stellar sea lions that you see there and red salmon or sockeye salmon. Now, why don't we date our origins from this? We're going to talk about the origins dating from another spot in just a moment. And I think the problem here is that a Fognac Island got folded into Chugach National Forest and then got handed off to the state park system, and then it was handed over to the, uh, uh, the tribal folks up there as well. And so it's not still within the National Wildlife Refuge system, and you know, so people don't really want to talk about that as our origin because we like our myths to be clean. So we started here. Who is this? Yeah, don't call him Teddy. He hated that so much. This is Theodore, or TR, Theodore Roosevelt. And TR set aside Pelican Island National Wildlife Refuge with that title in 1903. So this is where we start our origin story more typically, even though we really should be going back to 1871, right? So TR set aside Pelican Island to protect what? Pelicans, how about that? And other birds. Uh, so what was going on with the birds at that time? Feathers, yeah. Fashionable feathers. And we were decimating the populations of a lot of really beautiful birds. So uh, TR set aside this refuge, in part because he admired the guy who was taking care of it, who patrolled with a shotgun and kept people out of there. Yeah, the one guy who was uh, employed, and not for very much money either. TR set aside a tremendous number of national wildlife refuges and all sorts of properties that became National Park Service and U.S. Forest Service down the road. He also did another really important thing. He put this guy in charge of the Division of Economic Ornithology. That was under the U.S. Department of Agriculture at the time. And uh, it was created with the purpose of figuring out how we could enlist birds to help us with pest control on our crops. Doesn't that sound incredibly intelligent? And we've had this long experiment now with using chemicals instead. And maybe we need to go back to the original plan. Uh, but he put C. Hart Merriam in charge of this thing. Hart Merriam was uh, only 35 years old at the time. And he wasn't a bird guy. He was a mammals guy. He didn't really know that much about birds. But he was passionate about the natural world and our role in it and learning more about it. And he spent his entire career turning this thing into the Bureau of Biological Survey. He was really quite an individual. So TR knew his, knew his people well. Well, somewhere around the 1950s, all of these different little offices and organizations that were working with wildlife got scraped together 
into one big lump and umbrellaed under what was called the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So why do we call it fish and wildlife? Because we started with fish. The Bureau of Fish and Fisheries Commission said, fish has to be in the title or we're not playing. And that's really what happened. So now everybody's copied us, like we had some intelligence about it. But that's not really the case. It's just uh, we had some stubborn people is all. Uh, so it's Fish and Wildlife, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. Alaska Department of Fish and Game, a little bit different take on it. But the US Fish and Wildlife Service, and we got that one going. Here's our mission, working with others to conserve, protect, and enhance fish, wildlife, plants, and their habitats, recognize some of that language, for the continuing benefit of the American people. A little shorter, a little more succinct, not written by Congress. In fact, we could get a Department of Interior secretary who came in and said, no, nah, I'm going to rewrite that, and they could. Um, so this is not a protected statement, and we don't even know who wrote it. We have no clue. I've talked to our historians, no clue. There's bits that got added over time, like that working with others bit and the plants bit. You know, I have, I've worked with botanists, and they get really in a twist over how people don't think about plants. So they wanted to make sure plants got into the mission statement here. Uh, so great mission, I think. Covers a lot of good ground. Some of the ideas that went into the formation of the Fish and Wildlife Service come from people like this. This was Rachel Carson, and she was one of us. She was a biologist for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service at a time when it was not easy to be a female biologist, especially for the federal government, and she was a good one. And she wrote this book. How many of you have read it? Oh, that's really nice. Quite a few of you have. The rest of you need to go to the library. Silent Spring, really good book, talking about the impact of chemicals on our ecosystems. Very powerful. Here's somebody else who had a big influence in how we think about managing our land. And this is Aldo Leopold. How many of you have read A Sand County Almanac? Oh, so many more of you need to go to the library. This is a beautiful book. It's not just an informative one. It is a beautifully written book and highly recommended. And this is some of the foundational ideas that led to the big restoration project that happened in our National Wildlife Refuge not too long ago. So it's worth a read. One of the things that he said in that book, and I'm paraphrasing here, was that an intelligent tinker keeps all the parts. If you're going to be messing with an ecosystem, you better keep all of the wildlife that belongs there. So let's talk about our refuge and where that got going. We're going to start way back. We're going to go 10,000 years back to when the Squaliops, the Nisqually people, came over the mountains from the eastern side of Washington state and settled near the base of Mount Rainier. How many of you have been on Skate Creek Road up on Mount Rainier? Skate Creek is where they had their first settlement. And they expanded out. They had settlements in Michelle and in Yelm and in other locations. And when I say settlement, I'm referring to their wintertime settlements. These were where they built permanent structures, very large structures that were multifamily dwellings. And during the summertime, they didn't stay there. They traveled around because their grocery and hardware store was the natural landscape, and they had to move around to find what they needed. And that was quite a variety of things. This is a wonderful watershed full of resources. Now, maybe I'm a little bit of a slow learner, but uh, I struggled a little bit for a while with the idea of home. Uh, and my struggle began very early because I did not live in a town until I started school. My parents, who are here tonight, um, were in the park service. So we traveled from one national park to another when I was little, starting out at Mount Rainier with me. Um, but they've been to a few others. And I, when people say, where are you from, I have a little bit of a hard time answering that question because most people expect a two-word answer. It means a town and a state, right? So how many of you would say, oh, I'm from Lacey, Washington? Yeah, I, I couldn't do that. So when I was up in Alaska, I met an elder there, and his name was Paul. And I said, Paul, where are you from? And he said, well, I'm from Naknek. And he had a house in Naknek. He had a job in Naknek. Uh, his wife had a job there. So I'm like, oh, he's from Naknek. But then he came in to talk to me about a project on the Kanatic Trail, on the other end of the Kanatic Trail, which had been used for 2,000 years. There was a village. Nobody was living in it at the time. But that doesn't mean it's abandoned. It just means nobody's living in it right now. And he was a little kid in Connecticut. And so he even wrote a book that said, The Man from Connecticut. So he was from Connecticut. 
But then at other times he would say, oh, I'm from Igigik, because that's where in the summertime his family would go, where his dad would work in the fish cannery, and he had a house there, and he met his wife there, and that's where her family was. So I'm like, oh, I don't know. I don't get it. Where are you from? Well, he's from all of those places. He was from the whole area there centered on Besheriff Lake, the second largest lake in Alaska. And same way here, the Nisqually people are from the whole watershed. The whole thing is their home. Now, in 17, I always get this date wrong, 1755, I believe it was, the first European ship came to the coast of Washington, bringing with it smallpox. This is the Hesita, the Spanish ship, and you can see a model of it, actually, if you go down to um, Portland and check out the History Museum there. But smallpox was one of many diseases that decimated the indigenous population of both North and South America. Between diseases like this and outright genocide, the indigenous population population dropped by 90, that is a nine, zero, 90 percent. So by the time people started coming out here uh, to settle, they were finding landscapes that were far more depleted of people than they ordinarily would have been. Now, Fort Nisqually was built here in 1833. It was not a military fort. It was built up near where DuPont is. This was a fortified warehouse, and it was a way station between Fort Langley up in British Columbia and uh, Fort Vancouver down on the Columbia River. And they took in furs because the first wave of colonists coming across weren't there to stay. They were just there to take the fur bearers. And they took thousands of them. In this area, I believe 5,000 beaver went to Fort Nisqually. And in a very short period of time, there weren't any more beaver to speak of. Um, so they switched over to raising cattle and sheep and selling them to Russian uh, Alaska and other locations like that, out into Hawaii even. But I want to pause for a moment and think about the impact. So we had two big impacts here. One is people dying off, and the other is wildlife being depleted by the fur trade. This was fur trade on a very big scale, not like what we have today. And taking a keystone animal like the beaver out of the population has tremendous changes associated with it. For example, beavers build dams, right? Dams hold water in the landscape. And in the American West, there were lots and lots of beavers, and they had dams everywhere. And wherever there are beavers and beaver dams and the water associated with them, there's lots of other kinds of wildlife, too, because water is key to life. People coming through and removing the beavers from those ecos ecosystems caused the rivers to become channelized. The water ran off during storms instead of sticking around. It changed the landscape fundamentally. And it made a landscape that was really hard for beavers to return to because by the time they got back, the rivers are way down deep inside of canyons. They're really hard to uh, return to this kind of environment. There's a really good book. I like books. Um, and this book is called Eager by Ben Goldfarb. How many of you have read that one? Yeah, run, run, don't walk to your nearest bookstore or library and pick that one up. Uh, ben Goldfarb is a good writer and getting better. And that book, Eager, is about beavers in North America and elsewhere and the impacts that have occurred. One of the really astonishing things that has happened with the, um, the uh, use of water that people are making in the landscape, we are um, in some ways kind of a greedy species. We use a lot of resources for ourselves. And I just learned recently, and this really blows my mind, that we are taking so much water out of the ground in two locations on the planet, Northwestern India and the American West. We are withdrawing so much water from the aquifers that we have changed the tilt of the planet's axis by an inch and a half a year. It's still in the process of shifting because we're sucking so much water out that it's imbalancing the earth. Good grief. So we need to put some beavers back in that landscape somewhere, somehow. That's another story. So let's keep on going with this one. Once you've removed beavers from the landscape, you have open, fertile areas where you can graze your cattle, where you can grow your crops. Uh, so those lands became very quickly colonized by the incoming new residents. The other big crop that was going on out here next to the fur bearers was trees. What's the tallest tree in the world? Currently. There you go, coastal redwood. What was the tallest tree in the world? It was Douglas fir. On the Olympic Peninsula, very specifically. But we cut them all down and then went, huh, that was really big. 
Didn't even realize it. We were taking them down. We took them down so fast. Lots of people got really wealthy taking all the trees down in the Pacific Northwest. Well, here's people coming out. They're taking the beavers. They're taking trees. They're wanting to settle. And they don't really have rights to the land. So we needed to figure that one out. And the federal government appointed Isaac Stevens as the territorial governor and sent him out and said, sign treaties. So that's what he did. He arrived with pre-written treaties and said, uh, let's get people together and get them to sign it. So the very first one was the Treaty of Medicine Creek. That's right next to McAllister Creek, also called Shenanam Creek. And in 1854, he brought a number of tribes together and... Um, got them to sign this treaty. So the Nisqually or the Squaliopsh were one of those tribes. The Puyallup were another. But when I say tribe, that's a little bit misleading because that's really kind of a modern way of thinking about it. At that time, there were a number of Lachutseed-speaking people who were loosely associated. They didn't call themselves the Puyallup. That came later. Uh, but it was more convenient to group people together and there were some interesting expectations that were going on as well. The assumption was being made by our culture, by the American culture, that, uh, that groups were represented by single individuals. Well, that's how we do it, but that's not necessarily how other groups do it. And we also believed that there would be one person who could make those decisions and that that person would be a male. That's another cultural assumption. Here we have the Muckleshoot, but the, the Muckleshoot was actually a whole assortment of different tribes who didn't think of themselves as one people at all. And some of these tribes were matrilineal. Some of them were patrilineal. They made decisions in a variety of different ways. The Squaxin people were quite different from many of the other tribes in this area. They practiced head flattening, which was not something that you saw widespread in this part of the, of the country. So all of these people came together with an expectation of having at least a discussion and found themselves being coerced into a very particular set of agreements, which included ceding lands. But the one thing they did not give up, whether they were forced to sign, didn't sign, and had their names forged, or actually did sign, the one thing they did not give up was their right to hunt and fish in their usual and accustomed locations. And I'm using legal language here, language that comes from the treaty. But once those treaties were signed, it cleared the way for settlers to come in, and a great building boom occurred. Lots of cities and ports being established, lots of people coming out here, the population shot up. Now, amongst the beneficiaries of the lumber trade was Alson Brown, the fellow up there holding the, I think it's a little piglet. Yeah, look at those little cloven hooves. So Allison Brown was the son of a lawyer in Seattle who would, uh, excuse me, the son of a lumber baron in Seattle, and Allison himself was a lawyer, so a pretty smart guy. And he bought 2,000 acres of land here in the Nisqually Delta. The previous owner had started building a dike, and Allison saw it finished. Five and a half miles of dike, hand dug. I'm sure he paid really well. Who knows? But it got dug. Uh, and the purpose was to take the heart of the estuary and turn it into productive land for cattle and for farming to remove it from the estuary system. That red line represents where that dike is. So a five and a half mile long dike, that's a lot of work, by golly. And he was an extremely successful farmer. Uh, he didn't just raise animals and plants. He also established a trucking company and a packing company, and he knew how to get things to his buyers, get things to the market, and he was very successful. He was widely acclaimed as having a, a modern and diversified agricultural system going, but he wasn't smart enough to predict World War I, and he invested in silver mines in Austria in 1916. Oops. And lost everything. So creditors got the farm. Other farmers purchased it. A uh, couple different farmers bought the land and, and continued working it, but none that had quite the success that he had originally had. And so by the 1950s, people were saying, couldn't we do something better with this land? Like, you know, a landfill? Wouldn't that be great? Because Seattle and Tacoma were getting a little desperate. Their landfill was filling up. This is now filled. Uh, and they've had to move on to another location. So they proposed the Nisqually Delta as an option for that. 
well, any place that has a lot of water moving through it is a perfectly dreadful location for a landfill. Um, I don't know how many of you remember this, but when I was in high school, I remember there was a scientific study done to see where the water was moving through the landfill. They dumped a bunch of dye in the top to see where it would come out, and it came out people's taps. That's where it goes. So fortunately, there were enough people who opposed this to prevent that from happening. It went somewhere else. But the next proposal was a deep water port. Now, from the 1950s, the city of Olympia had been looking at it. And then the, um, the port of Tacoma got seriously interested in the 1960s, and they made a proposal. This would actually be a great location for a deep water port in many ways, because you go out to the end of the delta, and it drops straight off 200 feet. So it would be a good spot. But there were a lot of people who did not want to see the Nisqually Delta get turned into this. So opposition got going. At the same time that all of this was happening, we had something else that was going on around this landscape as well. The tribes were fighting for their right to hunt and fish in their usual and accustomed locations, as they had been promised. And they weren't getting what they had been promised, and so they started fighting back. They were doing fish-ins, for example. A number of people, including Billy Frank Jr. right here, uh, would go out fishing because um, whether the state of Washington agreed with it or not. And then the Washington Department of Game, as it was known at that time, would come out and arrest them and take their boats and their nets and their fish, and then their families would go hungry and they would have no money. And this went on over and over. Billy Frank Jr. here was arrested from the time he was a teenager uh, until he was well into adulthood. He was arrested more than 50 times. But something really significant happened in the uh, early 1970s. That was when this deep water port thing was going on and the Washington Department of, of uh, Game purchased some land out there in the Delta to try to block that development. And Billy Frank Jr., who had been their enemy, stood up and said, that's what we all need to be doing. Let's protect this place. How many people do you know who would stand up with their enemy because something was more important? That's why we know his name today. Well, by 1974, enough people had stood up to argue this point um, that two things were happening. One was the Bolt decision. So 50 years ago, next year, the Bolt decision was made. This was Judge Bolt who said, by golly, what kind of a country are we if we can't abide by our own treaties? They have the right to hunt and fish in their usual and accustomed locations. Specifically, they get 50% of the catch and they get to co-manage fishing here in Washington state. That is a decision that the state hated and contested and still argues against, but we've lived with it now for 50 years because it was the right thing. Now, there were some other people who, along with Billy Frank Jr., were fighting to protect this place also, to protect Nisqually National Wildlife Refuge, and that included a couple of movers and shakers. On the left, your left, is Margaret McKinney. I didn't know until uh, Christy over here in the audience pointed out that she was a mycologist. I have one of her books on my shelves. Holy cow. She was a well-known biologist, and she was also a school teacher in this area and a really good activist. So she got together with her neighbor here, Flo Brody, with the sunburst uh, that she's wearing there. And these two women were so effective at organizing uh, opposition to the refuge, or excuse me, opposition to development of the Nisqually Delta, that when they held public hearings, they had to hold two days of them to get everybody in that wanted to speak. So they were also instrumental. All of these people standing up together helped to create the Nisqually National Wildlife Refuge in 1974, and that was purchased with duck stamps. How many of you have ever been duck hunting? Yeah, not too many people. Um, if you go duck hunting, if you go waterfowl hunting, you have to have a duck stamp. And the duck stamp has been around for decades. The great thing about the duck stamp is 98 cents of every dollar goes straight to purchasing land for conservation. It cannot be used for my salary. It cannot be used for any other nonsense. It goes to buying land. That's what it's for. And you don't have to be a hunter 
to buy a duck stamp, sort of like taxing yourself and making sure your money goes directly to a specific purpose, which is buying land for conservation. So come buy a duck stamp from us. They're 25 bucks. They're gorgeous. Artists compete every year to have their uh, portrait of waterfowl on the stamp, and uh, we would be happy to help you out with that. Let's do a quick review. We've gone through a lot of time. We're going to go back 10,000 years here at the beginning of the spiral. 10,000 years of history of the Nisqually people, the Nisqually Ops being here in this watershed. Things started to change in a big way in 1492 when Columbus sailed the ocean blue, got to North America, and brought along those diseases that started making their way through the Americas. Over the course of the next few hundred years, 90% of the indigenous people will die. 1755, that first ship to the Northwest, the Aceta bringing smallpox. In 1833, that's when the, uh, the uh, Fort Nisqually was built up at DuPont. 1854, we had the Medicine Creek Treaty signed, ceding lands but retaining the rights to hunt and fish. In 1974, the refuge was established. That is a lot of action in a pretty short period of time, isn't it? So why did we go through all that? Why did we protect? this particular place. Why protect it? Here's an illustration from the 1970s that shows the black as asphalt, pavement, think of that as buildings, and the green as open space. And here's what it looked like just 20 years later. And we've gone another 20 years. What do you think it looks like now? How easy do you think it would be to protect a place as a national wildlife refuge today. I think we were just in time. What are we looking at here? Port of Tacoma, yeah. There's the Puyallup Estuary. And here's the Nisqually Estuary. I'm not saying that we shouldn't have this, although I will say we shouldn't have had it quite so polluted, but we need this but we also need this. And wildlife has to have this. They can't live without it. The Nisqually National Wildlife Refuge, when it was established, they created what's called a congressional boundary. That white line that you see up there, that's the congressional boundary, but we don't own everything that's inside of it. We own the stuff that's outlined in green within there. And the stuff that's outlined in the slightly more yellow color, that's actually tribal land. And embedded within there is some of that original Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife land too. So there's actually three different entities that own land within the refuge, but it's all co-managed by the refuge. And within that congressional boundary, what that means is that we can go ahead and buy land within that boundary without having to go back to Congress and ask permission. This is permission pre-granted, and it's a darn good thing, because here comes climate change. And as climate change is moving along, sea level is rising, salt water is making its way farther and farther into the refuge, 20 more years, we're not going to be able to occupy our own buildings, because... There will be flooding. We won't be able to drive the roads. The septic system will be infiltrated, uh, and we're not going to be there. When I mentioned this to our refuge manager, she said, you think we're going to last 20 years? Probably not. So we need to move, which means we're going to have to buy some land farther up the valley, higher up, away from sea level. But you know what? There's an awful lot of agricultural land in there that is protected as well. We need the agricultural land, too. How many of you folks have read anything by Jared Diamond? Guns, Germs, and Steel, totally fabulous book. Collapse. Anybody read Collapse? Collapse is a little hard to get through. If you don't read the rest of the book, just go read the back of it, because he summarizes everything into 12 points. Uh, and some of those points include if you lose control of your agriculture, if you don't have enough agricultural land to sustain yourself as a nation, you're on your way to collapse. So now we're having to choose. Do we want agricultural land or do we want wild land? It's not always easy to make these choices, but we're going to have to move those buildings. We can move them up on the bluff, but then we won't be down in the refuge. We can move them onto somebody else's land, but they have to be willing to sell it to us. We can't just take it. And we haven't found any willing sellers yet. Maybe we will in the next 10 years, but we better hurry. Now, luckily, we're not doing this alone. Remember, our mission statement starts with working with others. That's my favorite part of it. 
And if you look here, all of those stars are places where the Nisqually Land Trust owns property. They're out there purchasing private lands also and putting them into protection to help protect the river, the watershed, and the salmon that come up this river. Thank goodness we have some partners in this. Now, we are in a quite unusual situation. That white thing down there in the bottom right-hand corner, that's a really big mountain. What one is it? Mount Rainier. Mount Rainier is a national park. And down at the other end, that little boxed-in square there, that's Nisqually National Wildlife Refuge. So both ends of the river are in protected lands. That gives us a pretty good boost up. We've already got a good head start. So let's take a closer look at the refuge here and what's going on with it. Oh, you know what? I'm just going to back up for a moment and point one other thing out. What do you see that goes right through the middle of that congressional boundary on the refuge? Interstate 5, yeah. You know there's a proposal to lift that up off the valley floor? Yeah. Go to the Department of Transportation's website. It's called the Mounts Road to something or another um, project. But the proposal's on the books to lift that thing up off the ground and get out of the way. If we get out of the way, if we remove barriers to wildlife... They tend to come back. Salmon especially. I worked with salmon for a lot of years. They're a plastic species, and that means that they can flex, uh, and you can flex them to the breaking point and lose populations of them. But if you flex the other direction and you provide them with habitat, they come back in. We had a wonderful restoration project uh, that when it was completed, our biologist was in the river pulling the gate out, and it, he had fish going up between his legs to get into the new habitat. We take the dams out, like in Elwha River, for example, where they took two dams out, and by golly, the salmon are right back in there immediately. Dams and salmon don't go together very well. Highways and rivers don't go together very well either. So there's a plan on the books to make some changes, and we need to make some changes. Our wildlife refuge was officially established for the purpose of providing a place for migratory birds. But, of course, when you protect one kind of wildlife, you protect other kinds of wildlife, too. The estuary is critical habitat for salmon. And here on the west side, your salmon are in worse shape even than the salmon on the east side of the state. It's tough times. And estuaries are really important. Salmon are kind of mind-blowing animals. When the young salmon are coming out uh, to the estuary before they head into salt water, they need a place where they can rest, where they can make that adjustment from fresh water to salt water, and they especially need a place where they can eat. They need to put some weight on and get bigger in a hurry before they get out into the ocean and everything wants to eat them. Uh, and they can put on as much as 6% of their body weight a day <laughs> in the estuary. It's completely mind-blowing. Yeah, so this is critical habitat. And estuaries are incredibly good at providing food for wildlife. Let's take a look at this graph right here. The sort of periwinkle blue um, lines show you the original acreage of salt marsh. And the kind of burgundy red shows you the current um, availability of salt marsh. And you can see there's been some big changes. In the Duwamish and the Puyallup, there just aren't any more places for wildlife. In other places, they've been hanging in there. In fact, uh, if you look at the nooksack there, they've made a gain. They're the exception. Uh, but you can see that overall, we have lost a lot of salt marsh acreage. So it was proposed that it was time to do something about that. And we could do it here at Nisqually. What you're seeing is a photograph with the dike in place, an aerial photograph, the dike in place. That whole section there, that was originally estuary. And the proposal, which is a pretty bold one, is let's turn it back into estuary. So the project was uh, proposed, and this is with strong tribal partnership. The Nisqually were really driving this change. Um, they had some land over on the east side of the Nisqually River that was surrounded by dike, and they did what any good scientists would do. They took one of the little ones out, nine acres, so, you know, scale it down, make it a small experiment, see how things go. If it goes well, move up to the next step. So they took out, in 1996, the dike around nine acres, and it was good. So then they took out a dike around 31 acres in 2002. And that was working really well, too. So then they took out a dike around 100 acres in 2006, and it was even better. 
better and better for wildlife. So they said, okay, let's do it. 700 acres right in the core of the National Wildlife Refuge. Let's take it out. So the plan was not to just remove the dike entirely, but to shrink it. So the red line is the original dike. The sort of orange colored line uh, where the yellow areas are, that was the new proposed dike. They were going to pull it back, and they were going to have these um, smaller diked areas because they didn't want to give up entirely freshwater wetland because there's a lot of species that like that habitat. For example, cackling geese and northern pintails. They're coming in in droves right now. But that would leave this much larger area uh, returned to saltwater. So in 2007 and 8, they got going on it. Rebuilt the new dikes, tore out the old ones. Now by 2009, you can see uh, in this photograph, there's a lot of sediment. That was sediment that had been sitting there, not moving, for 100 years. And by the next year, it's back to being a channel. What was really cool about this whole experiment is that because that land had not been developed, it hadn't been dug up, it hadn't been deeply plowed or furrowed other than the dike itself, when the water came back in, it went right back into the same channels that were still waiting in the landscape for the water to return and turn them back into channels. So this is what it looked like. Here's what we had pre-project. And there's all those channels post-project. Isn't that cool? That added 21 miles of channels for small salmon to move back into. Truly a phenomenal success. This is restoration on a pretty grand scale. This is what Aldo Leopold was envisioning that we could do, that we could return the land to itself and bring it back. And now it looks like this at a high tide. Yeah, low tide's a little different. We had another change in 2015 when our refuge was named instead of Nisqually. It was named the Billy Frank Jr. Nisqually National Wildlife Refuge after the man who tried so hard to fight for his people's rights and then to fight for this place. And he spent the rest of his life doing that and working for salmon. A truly remarkable man. A little foul-mouthed, but uh, yeah, a remarkable man. A man who was willing to stand up with his enemies and to build bridges and to do what needed to be done for the sake of this place. He deserves having his name on ours, on our refuge. At the same time, they also created the Medicine Creek Treaty National Memorial. That is a five-acre piece that is, you remember, how many of you remember when you would drive down I-5 and there would be that dead tree sticking up, and that marked the site of the treaty trees? Yeah, well, a few years ago, that tree finally died its last death and collapsed, but they have planted new trees that came from those originals uh, that are descended from them on that site. That memorial is not accessible by foot. You can't get there. Um, from here. But what you can do is see it from the boardwalk. You can look back towards I-5 and you can see that section. And that memorial site is soon to be interpreted by the Nisqually people themselves, not by us, but by them. We just need another 150000 bucks so that we can build it. Uh, but they have a plan to put in a couple of kiosks at the refuge so that people can learn about this story and learn about what that memorial stands for. So I think that Billy Frank Jr. and Nisqually National Wildlife Refuge is a pretty remarkable place. But there's an awful lot of people before me who thought that, and that's why it's around today. If you love a place, it's worth putting the time in and the energy in, because it might lead to something that outlasts you by a good long while. Thanks for listening. So I think this is the question and answer period. We're going to pass the mic around. The purpose of the microphone is so that people on Zoom can hear what you're saying, too, because they can't hear you unless you talk into this. So here we go. Don't be too intimidated. There's only 73 people listening. <laughs> Questions or comments? Well, I guess I'll start. Um, I was thinking about it when you're... Um, giving these talks, do you have any moments in your career that you find most memorable that you've truly enjoyed um, working on or any projects that you've worked on? Oh, I'm so lucky. I, and sincerely, I am. 
when I was in college, I was forced to take a science class. How about that? It was a requirement that you couldn't graduate unless you took a biology class. And up to that point, I had been avoiding science because I thought it was the same thing as math, and I hate math. Uh, but I took biology, and I had a perfectly wonderful teacher who didn't care if I was sitting on the floor or hanging from the ceiling as long as I was paying attention and never turned away a question. So I was so excited by what I learned in that class. I took all the science classes that Capitol High School had on offer. And when I went to college, I went to college saying that I was not going to do what either of my parents did. My dad was a park ranger. My mother was a teacher. So I became a teaching park ranger. <laughs> I got a degree in environmental education. And what's even cooler is that I started working as that in my junior year of college. I was going up and working with the Forest Service in Alaska. Talk about a mind-blowing start to uh, get to go up to a place that wild. Uh, and I worked for the Forest Service for three years doing that, then for the Park Service. And I was a backcountry kayak guy. And finally, the Fish and Wildlife Service had the good sense to hire me uh, in a permanent capacity, but I have spent my entire career getting to talk to people about the value of public land. That's just fabulous. So I have many, many moments in my life where I go, wow, <laughs> look at that. This is really cool. Who knew? Uh, but I feel very fortunate that that's how I get to make a living. I'm the visitor services manager now for the uh, Nisqually National Wildlife Refuge Complex, so I get to mentor people in learning how to talk to people about the value of public lands, and maybe that's the best part. Thank you. Any other questions? Julia, you gave us some really big picture kind of concepts. Um, sea level rise, climate change, it's going to change the refuge that all of us have known for all these years. Um, the prospect of Interstate 5 being changed to open up the interchange of water and resources um, through the valley, the possibility that the refuge a few decades out might be a very different place. Can you talk a bit about how your agency tries to look ahead and plan for that sort of profound change? Yeah, sure. So one of the things I really love about the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is that they have a lot of scientists in the organization. I'm not one. I did study biology, but I'm not a biologist. I just get to hang out with them. They're my favorite people. Uh, and they work so hard to understand what's going on with the landscape and what we can do about it. So lots and lots of research goes into not just understanding individual sites, but doing it on a landscape scale. Um, so there are landscape management plans. We're right now in the process of uh, writing our comprehensive conservation plan. This is intended to happen every 15 years. I think it's been longer. But uh, we are working on that right now. And part of that process is looking at all the other plans that are out there that are being made with our partners uh, and looking at the science that's behind them. And so it's really interesting going through that process and learning to see a landscape through that big lens. How does it fit in with everything else? I probably forgot to mention that when they did that restoration project at um, the uh, at the refuge, that it doubled the amount of saltwater estuary habitat available in all of Puget Sound. It was a really big deal. And that was not done just by the refuge. It was done with all of our partners. And it was done knowing that we were in this larger context. The whole concept behind the National Wildlife Refuge system is about an interconnected network. These are places that are all connected to one another. We're connected all the way up to Alaska, to the refuges up there. Uh, for example, I worked for Alaska Maritime National Wildlife Refuge uh, for a little while, which is up in Alaska and covers a ridiculous amount of land. Uh, and there's a marvelous story there about one of their very first refuge managers happening to spot some Aleutian Canada geese. They were almost extinct. And he spotted them, and he saw which direction they were going, and he tracked them to the island where some of their last remaining nests were located. And working up there with also uh, the... Um, people down in Oregon, in the Willamette Valley, they discovered that the Aleutian Canada goose goes specifically to the Willamette Valley. So if you protect the places in Alaska and you protect places in the Willamette Valley and in the Sacramento Valley, which is another key area, and you protect their way stations along the way, then you have a future for the Aleutian Canada geese, and they have recovered as a species. Uh, so that's remarkable. Uh, but keeping that big picture and that connected network is a really important part of that. Did I answer your question, or did I just go wandering? 
Okay. So yeah. we have a, a question from online. Um, this person wants to know what your opinion is on taking down the dams of the Columbia River. Like on Snake River or on the main Columbia? I'll answer both. I'm assuming Maine, but mm. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, so Columbia River dams. I worked at, um, I was based out of Leavenworth National Fish Hatchery. We would release 1.2 million salmon every year out into the river. By the time they get to the ocean, we lost half of them because they had to hit seven different dams on the way down. And then coming back, they have to get past seven different dams all the way up. Dams and salmon really don't go together. They're a mess. But many of the dams on the Columbia River serve some very important purposes. Let's just look at the Grand Coulee Dam for one. Grand Coulee Dam cut off one third of the entire Columbia River to the movement of fish, a third of it. That's a giant loss of habitat for salmon. And there's no substitute for that. Uh, getting fish around the dam was at that time just almost completely infeasible. Uh, so it hasn't really been attempted until recently. People have started coming up with some concepts, but it's, it's never going to go away. That thing is still curing. Uh, it's gonna be around forever. And it does two things. Its original purpose was to irrigate more than two million acres of land in Washington state. If we didn't have that dam, we wouldn't have the agricultural system we have, we wouldn't have the economy that we have, we wouldn't be able to feed ourselves. The other thing that it did, and this was a kind of a, an afterthought, uh, was generate electricity, and it's actually become a huge electricity generator. I, I feel like it's maybe the third greatest producer of hydroelectric power in the world. It's a big deal. We're not giving that up. There's no way. And many of the other dams on the Columbia River serve some really important purposes as well. Uh, we're, a, we're a state that prides itself on green power. Do we wanna go back to coal? No, so we're gonna keep the hydropower. But there are other dams, dams that are no longer in use, for example, like the dams at Elwha River, for example, or even more important dams, like the ones on the Snake River. Some of those Snake River dams are not serving to irrigate large areas of land. They are not providing hydroelectric power, but they are making it a lot easier to move goods up and down the river. But we can come up with some other solutions for that. I really admire the, was it a senator or a congressperson? Help me out. Yeah, uh, congressperson. So that proposal was really a bold one. That's, talk about thinking big. If we can take some of those dams out, we might stand a chance of still having salmon in the Snake River, and otherwise I don't think it's gonna happen. I would love to see those dams go out. I would love to see us think that big for conservation. So, we'll see, maybe in my lifetime. All right, any other questions? Yeah, we have a couple online. Um, so, this person says that at the beginning of your talk, you mentioned part of the refuge complex included an area of land that was not called a refuge, and she can't remember what it, call, what it was called, and neither can I, <laughs> but they want to know uh, when it was created. Yeah, that's the Black River Unit, and I should know the date, but it's not in my head right now. Um, I suggest our website, but not with a great deal of faith because I wrote it. Um, but I, th I think the date is in there somewhere. Fairly recent, let's put it that way. Maybe, maybe the 80s, maybe in the 90s. Might even be more recent than that. At any rate, it was set aside because uh, some of the only Oregon spotted frogs in Western Washington were discovered there. The Oregon spotted frog is a very rare uh, animal. It's um, threatened federally, and it is on the state endangered species list. And the Black River Unit exists primarily to protect the Oregon spotted frog. Uh, we are continuing to expand. When we first created it, there was like, there wasn't any land. And we've just added pieces as we were able to. And in fact, there's a landowner right now who is interested in selling us his property. And that property goes right across the center of the whole refuge. So he would help us connect the whole thing by selling us his land. So we're very grateful to have people who are willing to help us expand that refuge. Now the Black River unit is not accessible by the public. Billy Frank Jr. is. So if you come to Billy Frank Jr. in Nisqually, we have four miles of trail, including the longest elevated boardwalk, I believe, in Washington. Uh, and it's really, really nice. We only have 97 parking spaces, though, so please carpool. Uh, but that's a great place to visit, but you can't visit the Black River Unit unless you become a volunteer for our biology program, and then you can go out and count frogs. So talk to me if you want to be a volunteer. Um. 
So this question comes from Dr. Timothy Ransom, who I'm sure you're familiar with. He says, uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service was unsuccessful in convincing the landowner, the Bryots, on the east side of the estuary to sell their land to the service for inclusion in the refuge in the 70s through the 90s. What has the service learned about working with private landowners since then? Yeah, so there was a, there was a workaround on that. One is the tribe that bought the land, and we co-manage with the tribe. So ultimately, we do get to manage that property. Sometimes it is insurmountable to get past people's prejudices toward the federal government, and those are often well-founded prejudices. Uh, when I was working in the Alaska Peninsula, so Alaska Peninsula and Besheriff National Wildlife Refuge, I served three, excuse me, 13 different villages, and my first flights out there, I was accompanied by Orville Lind, who was born and raised in here we go again, three of those villages, okay, born in one of them, but raised in several and had relatives and friends all over the whole thing. And I could go out there and I could wear this uniform. And that was thanks to Orville. When he was first hired, he was shunned for five years by many of his family members because he had joined this agency. And in part that is because people there conflated all government agencies with some of the things that have been perpetrated upon them by only one agency, and it wasn't ours. But if you wore a uniform like this, you were put into that box. But after Orville spent five very lonely years working on repairing relationships, then people started to see the difference between one agency and another, and to see the value that this agency had, because it was one of their own that was telling them how much it mattered. And that allowed me years later to come in and blithely wander around the villages wearing my uniform. And I'm very grateful for that work. It's hard work. It's hard work. And you're not going to convince everybody that you're on the side of good. But you do your best. And you get partners to help you, like the tribe. So Braggett was willing to sell to them, even though he wasn't willing to sell to us. And ultimately, what happened was the protection of that area. Thank you, Julia. That is actually going to conclude tonight's program. So thank you, Julia, for joining us today. We really appreciate it. And thank you all for joining us as well. And for the folks watching at home, we will see you again next month. Thank you so much.